Hi everybody. Today we're going to be talking about evaluating sources of information. This is something that's really critical for you in your role as students, but also in your role as just being informed citizens of the world. One of the great things about living in an era where there's so much information out there about every topic you could want is that if you want to learn about something, you probably can. But the downside is that it's become much, much easier for anybody to say whatever they want, whether they know what they're talking about or not. So it becomes really important to have some kind of method for sorting through and figuring out which sources of information are going to be most helpful and which ones are junk. Now, the method that we're going to talk about today can apply to any type of information, but we're going to be focusing primarily on websites, since that's where people tend to go for a lot of their information. And the method that we're going to talk about is something called the CRAP test. It was created by some librarians at Cal State Chico, and it's just a way of taking a given source and looking at it from five different angles to kind of get a, a composite picture of the value or worth of that source of information. So the first letter in CRAP here is C for currency, and this is just how new is this information. You know, if you're looking at a website and they tell you that they've got cutting edge research on the brain, but it was published 15 years ago, well, it might or might not be accurate, but sure as heck isn't cutting edge anymore. So if you're looking, particularly in an area where information changes quickly, you know, web design, brain research, whatever, you're going to want information that's pretty darn new. There are other topics where, honestly, this is less of a concern. You know, if you are writing a paper about Shakespeare, Shakespeare's works haven't actually changed in a long time, and so something that is 20 years old could actually still be very, very relevant and still very helpful. The second letter in CRAP, the R, is for relevance. And basically, this is just, does this source of information meet your needs? based on what you're looking for. So does it even address the topic that you wanted to learn about? And are, do you fit within its intended audience? Okay. So there can be lots of sites out there that are accurate, but they're aimed at different groups. If I'm getting information about some topic in psychology, I'm going to recommend different sources to students in my intro psych class than I would to colleagues who have a great deal of knowledge in the field. So relevance is just, does this even relate to what you wanted to do here? The first A is for authority. Basically, who wrote this and what makes me think that there's somebody I should be believing? So who is this? What are their credentials? Maybe. Maybe you don't know the person who wrote it, but what's the larger organization that sponsored this website and what's their authority? Uh, we can look for things like contact information. This is obviously not a guarantee that somebody is an expert in something, but one red flag is when you don't know much about who wrote something. So if I see an article that includes some kind of medical information, and it's written by Dr. Joe Schmo. Well, what's he a doctor of? Is he a medical doctor? Does he have a PhD in ancient history? Right? I don't necessarily know much, so he might be accurate, but why should I trust him? Whereas if it says, oh yes, Dr. Joe Schmo is a pediatrician in the Baltimore area, and his Maryland state, state medical license is number one, two, three, four, five, it could still be a lie, but the odds have just gone down because now this is something that I can check on. So I can be a little bit more confident that this is a real person who actually knows what they're talking about. Sometimes one way that we can find more information is by looking at the URL of the website because that might tell us who the sponsoring organization is and so on. So a couple of different ways that you can get information to help you evaluate the authority of the author. You can look for information about the organization, so things that say about us or philosophy. 
If there's a specific author listed, then you can look for their biography. Sometimes it's at the end of the article. Sometimes their name is a link and you can click on it. Sometimes you have to go elsewhere under the About section, and it might say About Our Writers. There are different ways you can look. But I want to give you one example here. This is from a website called eHow. It's a website that I've seen many of my students reference in papers. And it's actually kind of problematic. First of all, eHow is what we call a content mill. It's a website whose sole goal is to get you on their pages so that you will click on ads. So here, for example, they've got this big, huge Botox ad at the top right. That's how they make their money. Having accurate information is kind of secondary. It's nice, but it's not as critical. So in this case, they have actually given me the name of the author right up top here, right below the title of the article. And if I click on her name, I'm going to get a brief biography of her. So I can read through this and I can say, okay, she's been a journalist for 20 years. Okay, it's not formal education, but certainly she might have learned something in that 20 years. Certainly people do learn through research. And then I can look at her academic credentials and I learn that she attended Ringling School of Art, Charter Oak State College, and a master's degree from the University of Metaphysics. Is it possible that she knows about biological causes of depression? Absolutely, right? She's a, re an, a journalist. She might have done accurate research. But on the other hand, I don't know about you, but if I'm going to get this kind of information, I'd rather not get it from someone who had to take medical knowledge and interpret it. I'd rather get it directly from somebody who actually knows about depression. So for me, this is going to be a really big red flag about the authority of this particular website. Beyond uh, clicking on a person's name or about us, you can truncate the URL. So if you go to a long web address, you can cut off the latter parts of it to find out who is the sponsoring organization. And then if you need to, you can do a web search to learn about that organization. Okay. And one example that I want to give you here is an organization called Generation Rescue. It's a very well-known group. And if you go to their About page, they will tell you that they are the leading national organization for families with autism spectrum disorders. It's a very professional site, very scientific looking. They get a lot of attention. And you might be tempted to think, wow, they're the leading national group. But what happens if I go and do a web search about this group? And the next shot I'm going to show you is from Wikipedia. And I know a lot of you have been told, oh my gosh, Wikipedia is horrible. Wikipedia is not a good scholarly source. You shouldn't be citing in your papers. But I will tell you that most of the time, if you're looking for basic background information on a topic, you can probably do a lot worse than Wikipedia. For most things, they tend to be fairly decent. And on the more controversial sites, they actually now have it set up so that they limit who can edit a page because they always had such problems with people trying to, to put mistakes in there. So if I go to Wikipedia and I search for Generation Rescue, Right away, they advocate the view that autism is primarily caused by environmental factors, including vaccines. These claims are biologically implausible and lack convincing scientific evidence. And then just even looking at the table of contents, I see that they have been criticized on a whole lot of different grounds. This is not something that is going to make me inclined to trust Generation Rescue as a source of information about autism even though their site is very professional and very scientific looking. And they tell you that they're the leading national group, but obviously not everybody else agrees with this. So that can be a really good way to learn more about a group because otherwise the authority part can be hard if you're not already an expert in the field. Moving on, we're going to go to accuracy. This is another one that can be hard to evaluate if you don't already know a lot about the topic. So we have to look sometimes for kind of indirect indicators. Does it have statements you know to be false? Do they have a lot of writing errors? 
right? Someone could have accurate information with writing errors, but if they do have a lot of those writing errors, then that says to me this is someone who doesn't take, who doesn't pay attention to detail in their work, someone I'm not going to trust for getting accurate information. You know, what references are they using? If they're citing other scholarly articles, if they are citing other well-known, reputable organizations, this increases the odds that their information is also accurate. And then finally, can you verify their information elsewhere? So again, if you're doing research and getting information from lots of sources, what kind of consensus do you get from looking at all of those combined? And then finally, we need to look at the purpose of any given web page or the larger website. So for example, on eHow, I told you how their main goal is to sell. It's to get you to click on ads. Um, so we can look how many ads are on a page, what are they for? You know, are they kind of quiet and unobtrusive on the side or are they the main point of the page? Do the authors make their intentions clear? Are there alternative points of view? That one may be more or less important depending on the topic. You know, if I'm just telling you, uh, here's a list of all the U.S. presidents, there's no alternative point of view. The list is either accurate or it's not. But if they are talking about anything controversial, do they acknowledge that something is controversial, even if they have their own views on the topic? Do they deliberately omit important information? Uh, do they have biases that are going to let you know that the rest of their information is suspect? And the main thing to keep in mind with all of this is that you want to be skeptical. There are so many sources of information out there on any given topic that there is no reason to go with one that's iffy. You want to find one that you know is going to be reputable and reliable and go with that because why settle for less?